Hi, welcome to Lumi. In today's video, we will talk about vector valued functions in motion. This is a completely new topic because so far you have addressed mainly functions having as an output one real number. Now the outputs are going to be vectors. As before, our functions are going to have a domain, a set of real numbers, usually an interval. But the range is going to be a set of vectors. We will be mostly interested in vectors functions R, whose values are two or three dimensional vectors. This means that for every number t in the domain, usually an interval, the output function will live in R2 or R3. We will denote that output by R of t. Now, since this is a vector, it will have components. Each component will determine a function, a usual function whose domain is an interval and whose range, whose set of outputs are real numbers. We're going to call each output f of t, g of t, and h of t in the case of R3. In the case of R2, just f of t and g of t. All right, if this is the case, then we can express the image of t through R as the vector whose components are f of t, g of t, and h of t. Remember that any vector can be also written as f of t times i, this is a vector whose entries are 1, 0, 0, plus g of t times j, j is the vector whose entries are 0, 1, 0, and h of t times k, k is the vector whose entries are 0, 0, 1. Let's see an example with its graph. In this case, the vector valued function is r of t equals to a vector in R3. The components are cosine of t, sine of t, and t. Notice that t can be any real number because the domain of each of the components is the set of real numbers. Now, since this vector valued function lives in R3, we can graph the set of outputs of this function. When we do it, we obtain an elix. You can see the graph right here. As you can see, as t is positive and greater, the first two components are going to describe a circle. When I say a circle, I mean that when you project this into the xy plane, you're going to obtain a circle, as you can see here. What we are doing actually is considering the cylinder whose basis is the circle center at zero zero in the xy plane whose equation is x squared plus y squared equals to one. As t moves up in the z plane you are going to describe the elix. We can define the concepts of limits and continuity of vector functions. Let's see how we do it. Suppose our vector function is r of t and that it has three components functions, f, g, and h. We define the limit of r of t as t approaches a as the limit as t approaches a of each component. So we defined the limit of r component-wise. Now that we have the notion of limits, we can define the notion of continuity at a point A. So R of T is continuous at A if the limit as T approaches A of R is equal to R of A. This function R of T is a vector, is the vector whose components are these three functions, F of T, G of T, and H of T. R of A is also a vector. They are not real numbers. Be aware of that. On the other hand, T is a real number. This is a variable, the variable of this limit. 
and it is approaching to the real number A. Finally, we can say that R of T is continuous on the interval I if it is continuous at every point T in I. We can also define differentiability of vector functions. To do that, we follow a similar idea as with real functions. We consider the rate of change of this vector valued function R. And we consider the limit as H approaches zero. So R prime at T is equal to the limit as H approaches zero of the rate of change, R of T plus H minus R of T divided by H, just as before. The only difference is that now in the denominator, you have vector valued functions. All right, we can also use the following notation, dr dt, and this means exactly the same, r prime of t. This indicates that the variable is exactly t, and the function we are differentiating is r. To compute r prime of t, we have a simple formula. Remember that the limit of a vector value function is just the limit component-wise. Therefore, if we apply this definition of derivative of a vector value function, then its first derivative, r prime of t, is just going to be the derivative of each of the components. So r prime of t is f prime of t comma g prime of t comma h prime of t. So very simple. Remember that for real valued functions, we had a specific meaning for the first derivative of a function. We can also give a geometrical meaning to r prime of t when r is a vector valued function. Let's see. So r prime of t is called the tangent vector to the curve c. The curve c is the curve determined by the set of outputs of r. We saw an example, the elix. That is a curve described by this vector value function r. All right, so r prime of t is the tangent vector to the curve c defined by r at the point p, provided that r of t exists and is non-zero. Now, the tangent line to the curve at the point p is defined to be the line through P, so it passes, it contains P, and it is parallel to the tangent vector R prime of T. Now, we can consider a very important vector associated to R prime of T and R of T. This is just the tangent at T. This is a unit vector. This is R prime of T divided by the norm of R prime of T. Here we have the graphical situation. Remember that the tangent vector is r prime of t. This is the curve described by r. We call it c. And here we have the point p. We want to determine the line tangent to the curve at the point p. All right. What the derivative is doing is the following. So this point over here is going to be r of t. So t is going to be the point in the domain of r such that r of t is exactly equal to p. Now, we're going to consider a shift of this vector. So that's going to be represented by r of t plus h. So that means that we're moving along this curve c. This point determines the point q. All right, with these two points, p and q, we can determine the rate of change. R of t plus h minus R of t divided by h. This gives us this secant vector. As h approaches zero, you can see that this vector is moving along the curve and it gives us the tangent vector. Let's see an example to understand this idea better. We must find the parametric equations of the tangent line to the elix described by r of t equals to two times cosine of t comma sine of t comma t at the point of coordinates zero, one and 
pi over two. Here we have the vector equation that defines our elix. Since we are interested in the tangent line, we must find the first derivative. So this is our first step. To find r prime of t, we just differentiate each component of r. What we obtain is minus two times sine of t comma cosine of t comma one. We are just differentiating each entry as usual. Now the second step is to find a point t0 such that r of t0 is equal to the point that is going to belong to our tangent line. In this case, 0, 1, pi over 2. Given the definition of r, notice that the last component gives us the value of t0. So in this case, t0 is pi over 2. Therefore, r prime at t0 is minus 2 times sine of pi over 2 comma cosine of pi over 2 comma 1. And this is the vector whose entries are minus 2, 0, and 1. The next step is to find the parametric equations of the tangent line. The line passes through the point 0, 1, pi over 2. And it is parallel to the tangent vector, r prime of pi over 2. Now we put everything together and we find the parametric equations. This is going to be x equals to minus 2t plus this point 0, y equals to 1 plus this point 0 times t, and z equals to pi over 2 plus 1 times t. This gives us the answer of our problem. One of the most important concepts when we study vector valued functions is the curvature of a curve. Yes, as it sounds, curvature of a curve C. To understand this concept, we need the curve C to be parametrized by R of T. This means that the curve C is described by this vector value function R. All right, if this function describes the curve C, we can define the curvature and we denote it by kappa of T is equal to the length of T prime of T divided by the length of R prime of T. Now remember that t prime of t is just a unit vector. It is defined as r prime of t divided by the length of r prime of t. So be aware of the following fact. This is the definition of t of t. This is a tangent vector. It is normalized. It means its length is equal to one. In here, to compute the curvature, we're considering the first derivative of this function capital T. So don't get confused with this. To compute the curvature first, you must compute T prime of T. Then you plug it into this equation. You have to plug R prime of T as well. All right, what is the curvature of a curve? It is kappa of T, but geometrically, the curvature kappa at T is a measure of how quickly the curve changes at a point. As in real valued functions, for vector valued functions, we have the concept of integrals. To define the integral of a vector value function r, we're going to require that vector value function to be continuous. Remember that continuous means that each component is continuous. We need r to be continuous on a closed interval a, b. The integral is defined component by component. So the integral from a to b of r of t dt is equal to the integral from a to b of f of t dt, comma, integral from a to b of g of t dt, comma, the integral from a to b of h of t dt. Similarly, we can define the indefinite integral of a vector value function. What we do is defining it component-wise. So the indefinite integral of R is just going to be a vector whose components are the indefinite integral of F, comma, the indefinite integral of G, comma, the indefinite integral of H. And then 
instead of adding a constant as with real value functions, we add a constant vector that we're denoting by V0. Let's see an example. We must evaluate the integral from zero to pi of this vector value function. Its components are sine of t, three cosine of t, and t squared. We write dt to indicate that the variable of integration is t. We must integrate each component to find the integral. Let's do it. So the integral of our vector value function is the integral from zero to pi of each component separately. We know how to compute each integral. After we integrate using the fundamental theorem of calculus, we obtain the vector whose entries are two, zero, and pi cubed over three. Now we're going to see a very interesting application of vector valued functions. It is called motion. To understand this concept better, we're going to assume that we have a particle that moves through the space so that its position vector at time t is described by a curve c whose vector value function is r of t. Here we have the graph that describes such curve c. So from this graph, we notice that for very small changes on h, this vector, the rate of change, approximates the direction of the particle moving along the curve r of t. The magnitude of this vector measures the size of the displacement vector per unit time. This vector gives the average velocity over an interval of time of length h. If you remember this discussion for real value functions, you might remember that this rate of change allowed us to define concepts like instantaneous velocity or acceleration. We're going to do the same with motion using vector value functions. So we can conclude the following. The velocity vector is also the tangent vector and points in the direction of the tangent line. The speed, on the other hand, of that particle at time t is the magnitude of the velocity vector, that is the length of v of t. As for the acceleration, it is defined as the derivative of the velocity. So a of t is v prime of t, which it is r double prime of t. You can see here how similar these concepts are with respect to the concepts of real value functions. Motion is understood better with a concrete example. Here we have a vector valued function that uses the canonical vectors i and j. We're gonna find its velocity, speed, and acceleration when t is equal to one. Here we have the position function, r of t. To find the velocity, we need to determine r prime of t. Remember that we must differentiate each component. The velocity is 3t squared times vector i plus vector j. Therefore, v at one is the vector whose entries are three and one. Now we can find the speed. The speed is just the magnitude of v of t. This is computed as the square root of the sum of the squares of each component. In this case, we obtain the square root of 9t to the four plus one. If we plug t equals to one, we obtain the square root of 10. This gives us the speed at this time, t equals one. As for the acceleration, we must find v prime of t. It is equal to six times t times vector i plus zero times vector j. We are just differentiating this function r prime of t. This gives us the acceleration. When t is equal to one, we can plug t into v prime of t and obtain the vector of coordinates six, zero. This gives us all the information asked by the question. Therefore, we're finished.
Now we have a very interesting application to physics. We are given an object with math M. The object is moving in a circular path with constant angular speed omega. It has position R of t equals to a times cosine of omega t times vector i plus a times sine of omega t times the vector j. We must find the force acting on the object and we must show that it is directed towards the origin. Let's do it. Here we have our position function and a graphical description of the situation. We must find the acceleration. To do that, we must find first the velocity. It is r prime of t. This gives us minus a times omega times sine of omega times t times vector i plus a times omega times cosine of omega t times vector j. Great. As for the acceleration, we differentiate one more time and we obtain minus a omega squared times cosine of omega t times vector i minus a times omega squared sine of omega t times the vector j. We're just differentiating component by component. The next step is to consider Newton's second law. It gives us that the force is equal to mass times the acceleration. We know what the acceleration is. When we substitute it, we can factor out omega squared. And what we obtain is r of t back here in the parenthesis. Therefore, f of t is minus m times omega squared times r of t. Thus, the force acts in the direction opposite to the radius vector rt, and therefore it points towards the origin. Such force is called a centripetal force. It is time to recapitulate what we have learned in today's lesson. We covered the notion of vector-valued functions. In this new realm of functions, we can define the concepts of limits, continuity, derivative, and integral of this new family of functions. We also saw the concept of motion. This allows us to study the concepts of speed, velocity, and acceleration of objects moving either in the plane or in the space. This brings us to the end of today's lesson. Stay tuned and see you next time.